Hello listeners, Mark here with the next in our My Rugby League Story series. This time I chat with one of our listeners and we go back to the 60s in Hull to start this story. You might know I'm going to speak to as Joshua's granddad, or even as Sarah's dad, but on this show he's John, the Hull FC fan man and boy. With John being a great con- contributor to the history of our game's great players uh, from yesterday when we ran through all the positions in our lockdown episodes last year, you'll know he's got lots of memories to tell us about. So I was really excited about this one and having the chance to chat chat with John. So um, I suppose let's get to that chat with John. So John, welcome to Super League Pod, the 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 third and oldest generation of the of the Scoots clan to uh, to feature on the podcast. Um, but welcome along. Uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, unfortunately, the two generations before me are uh, no longer with us. So it, it would mean five generations to the Scott of clan if so we could all have made it. So that's how far back you go with, with Hull FC then. So um, take us back to 1895. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that'll be Grandad James that one, but uh, <laughs> you know I only met the gentleman a couple of times, and we didn't really share many memories. My grown-up rugby days was with my dad. Uh, we started watching together in season sixty-two, sixty-three, which wow. wasn't a great year from Hull FC's point of view. So we're, what sort of side were, were Hull at the time? And how is it, is it just a family tradition that you went along and not that Hull were a great side? So Oh, no. We, uh, Hull, as you've seen over the last few years, were a club that do really well for two or three years and then goes through a doldrum phase and then comes good again. You know, I think the word cyclic is Hull FC. Uh, and towards the end of the 50s, there'd been a, quite a... A big club in the country, couple of cup finals, one title, but it was on the downhill slope by the time I started watching. In fact, my first season, we finished bottom but one of the first division as existed in them days, and would have been relegated if it weren't for the the Tamil tradition of the rugby league to change the rules. <laughs> And it went from two divisions back to one division of almost regional fixtures where we played everybody in your half of the country once and then you topped up matches from the other side of the Pennines. So, obviously, that was when you started going as a, as a home fan. Nowadays, yeah. you're a home and away every game you can get to kind of fan. So, we, was it... Was it similar back then, or was it far harder to, to get to the away game? Oh, in no, the 60s? away matches were something you didn't do in them days. I think it must have been three or four years before I had my first away game, which was a, a trip to. Well, we, we, I remember a trip to Hedony to watch a seven aside tournament pre season one year. And then uh, my first one thing I can actually remember, first away game I can remember was going to Doncaster because I wasn't allowed to go to Craven Park in them days. <laughs> My, my dad was very strange of the of the of view. You don't give them runaway bastards a penny. <laughs> oh, so it and, wasn't because you were worried about anything kicking off. It was that maybe. Oh no! It was you, you just, your dad didn't want to give him any of his hard earned cash. Basically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no messing on dad's part. It was not going to be <laughs> land their pockets. Uh, and so, who were the? I guess the stars of the whole side in those early days of you going in the sixties. When I started, the, the start was uh, Clive Sullivan, who's not long to stand for the club. We had a South African winger on the other wing called uh, Wolf Rosenberg, who was a bit of a flyer. Uh, Johnny Whiteley was coming towards his own end of his career. And my own personal favourite in those days was a fullback called uh, Arthur Keegan, who was the Great Britain fullback at the time. So, as a club, we still had some star players, but there's a lot of local journeymen in there as well to make the numbers up. Yeah. And how, how would you follow the games if you couldn't get to the games then? Was it was it on radio and that uh, sort of No, stuff? no, you just had to uh, wait for the uh, results to come up on grandstand on the Saturday tea time <laughs> and then wait for, wait for the sports mail to come out in the evening to see the fix, uh, to find out what had happened. Away games was something of a mystery. And... 
sort of traveling forward then um in time when when did when did you get to see a really good whole side in your times following the club oh we had a little bit of a flurry at the late 60s when we won the Yorkshire Cup uh 69 uh which was a those days it was a train across the lead to go and watch anything uh and unfortunately the cup final day itself we had problems on the train so it was late getting late getting to the heading uh lead station i've just got vivid memories of the train pulling into lead station and hundreds of men running down the platform and this poor t- t- ticket lecture at one side just standing to one side and let him all throw. <laughs> and all the all the buses towards Hedley was just, well, to say they were overloaded was an understatement. Because again, we'd actually kicked off by the time we got there, but all was good. Uh, the game proceeded and we David Old Davidson lifted the cup at the end of the match. I'm sure it was a a, a, a less strained journey home then <laughs> that day. From <laughs> yeah, it's much more calm. <laughs> and yeah, uh, that was it. We're, we're glory days again. But then we hit the seven, early seventies, just chugging along, and then we really went through a deep doldrum period, seventy three, seventy four, where the crowd you know fell away. To we actually the uh, nine hundred eighty three gate one day. Uh, wow, when people match. talk about crowds declining now, if you get less than 10,000, you get less than 1,000. Yeah. And yes, what sorry, people turn the good old days sometimes. It was a home match against Hoyton, if people remember Hoyton. Uh, and it was the same day as Hull City was playing in the FA Cup just down the road against uh, uh, Stoke, I believe it was. Mm. So whether that had drawn a few away, but yes, the gates at that time really did struggle. Uh, but it it, it sure. must have started to pick up again, for sort of the as the eighties started and Hull well, was even, was even the main towards, power, it, wasn't it? Both sides of the even city. After, even after that period, we perked up a little bit. We had a even when a second division team, we got through to the John Play Cup final at Headingley to get beat by Widness, which was a a great great achievement for any second a second string team. Uh, we beat the uh, the Millionaire Club of Leeds in, on the way there, which is always an achievement that something that Hull fans actually really do appreciate. I think, quite possibly to the current generation of fans, beating Leeds is more important than beating Rovers. <laughs> it's, it's. I mean, I, I, is that when that Leeds rivalry really built? Then maybe in the in the seventies, sixties, and seventies, as they were seen by the big city rivals. Big, uh, I'm not, there was a lot of nastiness between the two clubs late 60s uh, I don't know whether you're the other listeners uh, have any knowledge of the fishing trade in Hull which the fishing fishermen have always been allowed, allowed to Hull FC from the docks and the uh, trawlers in 68 there's a triple tragedy with three do- uh, three trawlers sinking in eight days, with a lot of a lot of lives. Yeah, and uh, Leeds came to Boulevard the following Saturday, and during the two minutes silence before the match, that's when the uh, horrible chant was going down. We are trawlers, started for the Leeds fans. Uh, uh, excuse me. Shocking stuff. Yeah, and I think. That cemented the, the animosity between the two clubs. Right. So, and then obviously in the more recent times when Rovers were out of the limelight for for so long, I suppose that that helped yeah, re- reinvigorate that a little enemy. bit when you didn't have your main rivals. Um, yeah. That's that's awful. Um, so yeah, so late seventies, early eighties was a yeah late a big 70s, period, early 80s, wasn't it, in the uh, city. A, it was a golden time in many ways because, you know, we'd be, we signed it all the time, the Australians, the New Zealanders. Uh, we had cup finals. Although, looking back on it, I always think we never achieved what we should have from that generation. We had a team of world stars. We, you know, even the journeymen in that team were quality players. 
So pick out some of your favourites during that that period of the the team that was successful, but maybe could have even been more successful. You've got a uh, Steve Norton, who was a quality player. Uh, Peter Sterling came and played for a year and a bit. Yeah, he's yeah. still talked of reverently by, by Australians as a half back. Uh, James Lulai, Gary Kemble was a favourite of a man. Fullback would caught everything. You know, yeah, if look, it meant you that. You're fullback. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am. I've never played fullback in my life. But I, I, I do love a fullback. I, I think that most of my land plays on the park sometimes. <laughs> uh, but Kemble was one of these weird players. He never never let a ball bounce. You see him dive you know, yards to catch the ball in full flight. Uh, and then we had possibly one of the most talented players if he ever had the application for it in Mike Crane. It every bit of skill going. But the local the local wags would tell you Mike's only problem was he couldn't pass he couldn't pass. Not not the ball, a book is was his problem. <laughs> But so he's, uh, he's distracted player. by off off the field stuff, maybe yeah. that, that influenced things. And um, what what were the I suppose standout matches that you remember from from that great team then with all them stars? The uh, Flublik Cup final was seventy nine. When we well, unfortunately, I was I was a student away at the time, and I'd, I'd seen the semi final on on the uh, on Tuesday night on, on telly. First thing I did was phone home, get me a ticket for the final. And I came home at the weekend and no ticket was had. <sighs> and my normal people I talked to, no spares. So they'd be trying to think, well, if I go early enough, I can go over the wall behind the threatenies <laughs> and get in. And then that tea time, a ticket, a ticket appeared. So I got into, got into get to the game. Uh, and I think it's the first time I saw the boulevard actually packed to the rafters. I mean, it's a, a big ground, and there's thousands in there. And uh, it, you know, make it even better. You know, we're playing rovers. Yeah. And we we just played him off the park. Uh, we had a young young kid played out the wing, Steve Dennison, who had the game of his life. Scored a fifty-yard try and kicked goals as well. So yeah, that was, that was the first major big game that I really experienced that that buzz from. Yeah. And then, then we uh, unfortunately the same season also included a game in down in London that I'm sure Tom Andrews will remind you of, even if it we weren't there. <laughs> When 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 the last person out of Hull had to turn the lights off. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's horrendous because, uh, as you know, I used to be a children's nurse. Yeah. So you, you, the average of my patient was like 10, 11 year old kids. And we, we'd talk rugby because it's always a good thing to talk about when you're working. And these little little shits would come up to me and say, 10 fab, 10 fab. <laughs> It, and, you know, we we stuck with that for bloody years afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think t- times then started to change, didn't they? After both the whole clubs had the uh, well, peak in the after, early eighties. After 80s. that week, yeah, yeah, we had a year off. Then eighty two, we uh, played Widnes at Wembley, and we we drew fourteen apiece before we went back to Ellen Road for the replay. And uh, Topless just ran that game. We had a, a cameo masterpiece from Lee Crooks, but Topless was just awe inspiring that match. So we, we fi- I finally got to see Hull FC lift the Challenge Cup. But, just not at Wembley. <laughs> but I did t- tell us it wasn't there. Then uh, 83 was the big Wembley upset when the bookers had stopped taking bets, basically, because it was such going to be such a one sided game. Unfortunately, nobody told Featherstone that that was supposed to be happening. Yeah. And then the last big game of the mid '80s was a '85 Cup final against Wigan. Uh, so, we, were we, you at that game? One of you, the sort of most famous 